Yeah, so this is a book I started working on uh, early this year. And the idea where it was coming from was I wrote this book, The Connected Company, uh, which is really about, uh, you know, sort of uh, a new type of company that's emerging that's sort of uh, flatter and more network oriented than traditional companies. And people started coming up to me asking, this is great. I want to be, we want to be a more connected company. What should we do? <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't have an answer. But I love when I don't have an answer because that gives me the idea for the next book. And so I started, I, I, I had a feeling that there was something in the process of agile software development, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, that could be applied across all business, you know, all kind of business structures and there's a way to operate a business. Some people talk about the lean startup now. So that was where I started. Uh, I interviewed a ton of people. They're all up on the web, uh, so I tend to work in public. There's, if you care to uh, watch 60 or so hours of YouTube interviews, you're welcome. Just look up Principles of Agility, you'll find it. Um, but every, the more I talked to people, the more I got confused. And it turns out there's all kinds of different ways that people think of Agile. And in fact, a lot of people who are doing Agile are extremely frustrated because they're in an organization that is not agile and they're trying to operate and so they're not able to be agile. Uh, I also am reading a lot of books. So it's, you know, it's like a, it's a lot. <laughs> so I really got myself confused, honestly, turned around. What is, what is it that I'm trying to do with this book? And I, uh, that's, what, that's what David was saying a minute ago is I kind of came around to what I'm answering in this book. The question I'm answering is that person who every time I give a talk about change, change management, uh, you know, how to drive change and so forth, I always get this question, which is, you know, this is great, Dave, but I'm not the CEO. I'm not in charge. I don't have the project ownership. I don't have the mandate. I'm, I'm in the middle. I know we need to change. Our company is screwed up, <laughs> right? But what can I do? And I've chosen to illustrate my talk today with cute animals in keeping with the spirit of the day. What can I do, right? So I think the title of the book is probably morphing and changing since we first set up this talk. And I think what, I, what I'd like you to think about today and what I want to talk to you today is this idea of hacking social systems. What can I do from the middle or the bottom or the front line? What can I do to make something change in my company? if I don't have the power. And actually, funny enough, so I've been exploring this and working on it, figuring it out. Funny enough, it's actually the best thing for the CEO to do too. <laughs> Same approach is also the best approach if you're leading change. But that's sort of accidental to this inquiry. So here you are, right? This is you. You're the rabbit in this story. In the middle, somewhere, deep, deep in the heart of the company. And this is how I've come to see large organizations. They're really complex. We have this fictional idea that the goals are set at the top and they roll down. But what's really happening is everybody has their own goals. They're, they're just pursuing their own goals and the organization is helping them do that for one way or another. Right? So think of them, I think, think of this as a big game world, right? Where everybody's, you know, sort of a big collaborative virtual reality game world where everybody's pursuing their own objectives. They're crossing paths. Sometimes they're going in the same direction, sometimes not. Okay? Think about, I asked a question at breakfast this morning and I, you know, do you think that the websites we design express the dysfunction of the organization that created them? <laughs> and that was the answer I got, yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. All right, so here's the thought. If we could fix the dysfunction in the organization, imagine what could happen to the website, <laughs> right? Just imagine that for a second. Anyone hear the term superorganism before? It's a term for biology. So basically ants, termites, uh, what they call social insects. A superorganism is a society of 
creatures that operates as, in some ways, more intelligently than the creatures that make it up, or in some ways, differently anyway. So think of your organization, think of it as a superorganism, a life form, like a life form. It has its own thing that it's doing. It's probably serving customers, but that's probably only part of its real purpose. You know, it's, often its real purpose is to give people jobs in the company, in a lot of cases, right? Keep things going. I've worked as a consultant with companies or, organi or nonprofit organizations that fulfilled their mission. They're done. What a horrible feeling. <laughs> right? What a horrible feeling. We fulfilled our mission. What do we do? <laughs> we have jobs. <laughs> It's a change management challenge. Okay, so think of it as a superorganism that's a game that you're inside of. You're a cell in this giant brain, okay? Now, this full of paradoxes. An organization is full of paradoxes, and the, one of the most basic ones is an organization has to attract people to join it, to hire, to work there, to be part of it, but at the same time, it's got to constrain them and take away their autonomy to some degree so they can coordinate their activities and work together, right? So there's these forces that are trying to pull it together and trying to rip it apart all the time. Okay, so I'm giving you some context. We're going to get into some stuff you can do in a minute, but I want you to, I'm giving you some ways to think about your company or your organization. So here you are, somewhere in the middle, and you're at this fork. You have, feel like you sort of have this crossroads. You can play the game or you can not play the game, right? Playing the game means competing for the rewards and incentives and all that stuff. Not playing means, you know, checking it in, checking the boxes, right? But the thing is, here's the thing, there's a middle road. You can change the game. Changing the game is where it's at, <laughs> I says Dave. <laughs> this is, but this is what I want to talk to you about. So there's this character, the reason I chose a rabbit is that there's, a, there's this character in mythology and folk tales that's been get around forever. You know, back to Odysseus and the Norse god Loki, and in, a, in a, uh, America we have coyote and rabbit and raven and brer rabbit in the south. And the, the, the thing is, there's a lot of wisdom in these folk tales about how to, um, how to turn the tables on this, the game that you're in. Okay? Trickster is the one who steals fire from heaven and brings it down to the people usually tricking the gods in heaven somehow, right? And I, don't, I, I had a trickster tale in here that I was going to tell you, but I tested this, this talk on some friends, and they said, that was really boring, and I don't know what the point was. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you the trickster story. <laughs> uh, okay, but we are going to go on. So there's a couple of challenges here. They said the story was interesting, but it didn't connect. So anyway, I'll tell you later at a cocktail hour if you want. Challenges, number one. In order to change this game, you have to understand the game that's being played today. And it's very complex. And there's a lot of games that make up the bigger game. That's number one. Number two, you have to create the new game within the structure of the existing game if you want to, don't want to get fired, right? You, you have to use somehow the rules of the existing game in order to, you have to create the new game within that context. And the third piece is, you can't play this game by yourself. If you're trying to change the organization, you can't just play it in your mind. You have to actually play it within the organization, okay? So, now, I'm gonna tell you how to do this. Three things. One, this comes from Deming. By the way, I read a lot of books. I'm not gonna reference them all, but uh, I will when I finally get the book out. Uh, but W. Edwards Deming said this 50 years ago or more. Study the system. Only the Japanese list, and, and that's why Detroit is uh, basically a, a kind of a wasteland today. Study the system. Study the system. If you're from Detroit, I don't, I don't have anything against Detroit. <laughs> but, it, I mean, Detroit has suffered because uh, the automakers, big automakers, failed to study the system. Tinker with the system. So in order to change the game, you must understand the game, right? Study the system, therefore study the system. You must create the new game within the context of the existing game, therefore, tinker with the system. And you can't play the new game by yourself, therefore, 
help the system become aware of itself. That's the people in the organization. And yes, I guess in a way I'm talking about guerrilla change management here. So these are three things. We'll go through them. So let's start, first talk about studying the system. How do you do that? How do you study a system? Okay, remember, I talked about a superorganism. You're an ant, right? You're an ant in the ant farm, ant colony. You're a little ant. How are you going to study this system? Four basic elements. And by the way, they're the elements of any story, right? You have actors, people in the system, people. They have goals. They won't always tell you what their goals are, but they have them. And they have constraints, the things that keep them from their goals, and the resources which are the things that they use to help them get to their goals. These are the four basic elements. Now, if, it's all, if you're only talking about one person, that's probably not that hard to understand. But when you get 50, 80, 100, 300, 1,000, 5,000 people all doing this, all different games, it gets really complex really fast. Does make sense? Okay. Think of this this way. The goals are things people want. Constraints are things people avoid. Resources, things people use. One person's resource might be another person's constraint. Complaining about my email could be a resource. <laughs> right? Could be a way for me to get out of a meeting. Important phone call in the middle of a meeting could be a resource for me. Way to get out of it, right? So it's not just what's on the org chart, right? It's not what, just what's in the roles and job descriptions. It's how you think about and how you watch what's going on around you. Like I said, put all these things together, you get a lot of complex behavior, complex interactions. And here's the thing. In order to start shifting the system, you don't focus on the objects. Don't focus on the people. Focus on the stuff when the storylines meet and there's problems or good things, right? Focus on the connections and the interactions that happen. I'm going to put a little meat around this and I have some examples to tell you, some stories. So what are some clues to things that you might want to focus on in an organization? What might you look for, okay? Well, you might look for people avoiding things. I heard a story about a CEO, just reading it today, who when going to, had his, first of all, had a big office that was isolated from everyone, a bathroom, private bathroom, um, window that looked out away from the corporate campus, and when he had a meeting on the corporate campus, he would take his private elevator down to his private driver, drive him to the other building, come up to the meeting. Can you imagine? Avoidance. He's avoiding people in the company. This is the CEO. All right, use, usage, what do people use? Look for the things that people use. What are their go-to things? Sometimes they're things that they complain about, but they're using them. Conflict. Where are, where are, there, where are there issues where conflict has arisen? These are all good things. These are good things because these are things you want to see because they are indicators that something's about, could, possible to change. Positive deviance. People doing good stuff, oftentimes having to keep it secret because it's somehow maybe against the rules or they're not sure if it's against the rules, but it's, it's under the radar, right? Positive things that are happening that other people, maybe other people don't know about. Complaints. People don't complain about something they don't care about. People complain or they're frustrated by things that they really care deeply about. That's a sign, a clue. Feedback loops and oscillations, which I'll talk more about, but basically, if you know about agile software and you know about lean startups, you know about feedback loops. Oscillations are things that kind of oscillate between one thing and another. Um, so what do you do to study the system? These are the three things, I think, that come into studying the system. You've got to wander around, you've got to look, and you've got to listen. Wander around. Because in order to understand this bigger game, you've got to get as many perspectives, as many points of view as possible. Talk to the turtle at the water cooler. Talk to the owl. Talk to the fox. 
Don't forget to talk to the elephant, right? But talk, especially talk to people where you see conflicts, complaints, etc., where you see their potentially problems or interesting things. As you wander, this is really important, you have to detach yourself from your own personal goals and specific outcomes that you want. Because if, if you're in it for yourself, you're not going to get any, anyone to, to join you in anything. You have to be in it for the bigger picture. And I call that a fuzzy goal. The fuzzy goal is this company, this organization is trying to become something. I want to help it become whatever it is it's trying to be. See that? Hear, me, hear, hear that? It's not, I'm going to drive this change. It's, it's more like a midwife or something. And you know, it's like, I want to help it figure out what it's trying to become. Because it's trying to become something better. OK, this is, again, an example of an oscillating pattern. So this happened in my company over and over and over. Uh, was too, it's, we're, we're a creative company, but it's too chaotic. We, it's too crazy around here. We need more structure. So we add more rules and processes and so forth. And sooner or later, someone says, oh my god, it's too rigid. It, we need, it's completely inflexible. We need more flexibility. And then we go, OK, we'll remove some of the rules, et cetera. Ever see this in a company? Raise your hand. Nobody? <laughs> yeah, you're just not raising them very high. It's late in the day. OK. Um, here's another example from uh, 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 Genevieve Bell's talk this morning, which I loved. You know, it's familiar, 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 boring. Surpr so it surprised me. And he surprised me. It's like, oh, that's creepy. That's freaky. Let's go back to familiar, right? It's an oscillating pattern. So when I say look, this is what I mean by look. Look for patterns of behavior, things that are either kind of like vicious circles or virtuous cycles or things that are oscillating and so forth. Look for stuff like that. Watch what people do. Watch for patterns that happen over, over time. Listen. Now, we've talked a lot about storytelling today. Um, and I hear a lot of people talking about storytelling. But I want, to t I want you to think about story listening, how to hear a story. Because I think that's way more important than storytelling, way more. So think about this. Okay, we've got, now we've got some different animals. I've got the dog, the cat, the mouse, and the cheese, and the hole. Okay? So what's the resource in this picture? Cheese, resource, right? The hole could be a resource for the mouse, but for the cat, it's a constraint, right? See what I mean? The cat might be a resource for the dog. The dog might be a resource for the mouse. Dog might be a constraint for the cat. See where I'm saying? See where I'm, see where I'm going with this? As you wander around and you're watching what's going on, you start listening to people, listen to their stories. And you can't do that if you have an agenda for yourself. You have to empty your mind and try and hear their story. Who's the hero? Who's the villain? What are the resources? What are the constraints? What's the goal? What's going on? Who are the allies? Right? Who are the good guys in the story? Who are the bad guys? What's happening in the story? And by the way, you can do this with customers. I don't, this isn't limited to an organization. This, is, this could be a whole industry, or this could also apply in any you know, family, any group, any human group. But listen, story listening is not something we talk about much, and I wish we would talk about more, because by listening to stories, especially if you can triangulate, and you can listen to a lot of stories, you will start, and, especially, and if you can also dry, diagram stuff, you will start to build a picture of that bigger game. You will really start to get a deep understanding of your company and what's going on. So that's the first goal, is to try and see that whole organism. Try and see the whole thing, the big game. Many different perspectives. Erica Kachi is someone I talked to in one of my interviews. She worked at UNICEF. This is a story of not doing this, how it can go wrong. So they had a, um, a thing, in, I think it was in Uganda. They said, OK, we're going to help the Ugandan people tell their stories to the world. And I think they had a mobile phone company, gave them a whole bunch of free mobile phones. They went out to Uganda. They went to the farmers and people in rural areas, gave them a phone, tell us your story. What do you think happened? Here's what happened. Why am I, what do I tell a bunch of white people my story? Why should, I, why, why, do you, why should I take this phone and tell my story? What do I care? 
I want, a, I want like street lights. <laughs> I want water. I want clean water, right? So this whole thing blew up in their face because why? Because they didn't walk into the system, spend time trying to understand the system before they tried to help, right? And here's the, something I've heard over and over and over from humanitarian aid workers, including Erica. The way to solve problems in areas of the world that need help is not to come in and rescue people. It's to find the solutions within the system that's already there. So it can be helpful to have an outside person come in, like a consultant, right? Come in, help you see things that maybe you didn't see. But it's not helpful to have someone fly in and drop food on you and rescue you. Someone was talking about a, you know, there's a company that, uh, I forget the name of it, gave free t-shirts. Like you buy a t-shirt and they'll send one to the third world. Something like that. The problem with that kind of solution is, there's someone in the third world who's making t-shirts, making for a living, and you're putting them out of a job. You're actually weakening that whole system by trying to help. I think maybe it was sneakers, sorry, it was sneakers, it was shoes. Okay, here's another guy. This guy is a US military strategist in Iraq. And I, he, was, he was there through the surge and he was there through, through some really interesting times when they were starting to figure out um, what was going on there. And I asked him, what was the, when was the aha moment for you, Roy? What, when did the, the light bulb go on? And this goes back to looking. He said, actually I was two people, two guys sitting around a map. And I had the political map of uh, Basra, I think it was. And we, were, we, were look, I would look, we had the city districts and the politicians and so forth. And I just had a friend who's in the Special Forces. We never really talked to each other officially, but we were having a beer, and I had the map there, and he said, you know, it was interesting. Let me, let me draw the tribal boundaries on this map for you, because they're not the same. You know, you have a Shia uh, governor, Shia police chief, but it's a primarily Sunni population, and here's a Sunni tribal chief, and here's where he is, and here's his region. And all of a sudden, the thing started to make sense which is the story of triangulating, right? Getting different perspectives, overlapping the maps. And he t Roy talked to me a lot about, you have to have uh, the, the ability to switch theories of what's going on. If you just have one theory about what's going on, you're missing huge chunks. So if you see, if you see someone acting in your company, like it doesn't make sense, this, this is, doesn't seem like rational behavior, this person seems like crazy, or they just, or you, you're, you're missing something because their behavior makes sense to them. And so if you think that you can't, you know, if you're trying to make change happen, you can't just be like, oh, it's just an asshole, it's just an asshole. Then you gotta figure out, why does that behavior make sense in this organization? Why is that person doing that? You gotta hear their, you gotta figure out their story as best you can. So that's one, study the system. Then what? Then what? Okay, you gotta start to tinker. You have to poke the system, poke it. So, two ways to do that. One is increasing your wiggle room, your personal wiggle room, and wiggle room of others. And then you gotta poke it. What do I mean by that? Wiggle room, no matter how many controls or rules surround you, you always have wiggle room. Rules can't possibly envision every circumstance. There's always wiggle room, always. I shared this on, I was working on Facebook with some friends of mine, and then somebody gave me this photo. Yeah, see here, here's what you mean. Right? This is you. 90% of the things that you think are constraints only exist in your mind. They only exist in your mind. I made up that number, but 90% is probably close. You have all kinds of power. And this, is, this comes from a book called Actors and Systems, a French study of French bureaucracy in the 60s, believe it or not. Four sources of power in organizations that you can think about. One is the, what we, the one we all know, the rules, right? There's the written rules, there's also the unwritten rules. Just things that you figure out as you go, right? Expertise. Anyone ever work for a technology company where someone knew so much that they were just unfireable and they were a total dick? <laughs> Does that sound familiar? but you can't get rid of them because they know too much and they know you know that you can't get rid of them and they, that's where, how you get a sociopath, right? <laughs> you have, basically what that is, is it's a monopoly. Someone is, has a monopoly 
on something in the organization. And when an individual has a monopoly, they start act, acting like any monopoly, <laughs> right? And it's just, that's, that's why they do it. Information, knowledge. The finance, finance group has lots of information. That's very powerful. The more you know about how the company makes money, et cetera. And then there's relationships. That's one of the best, biggest leverage points, I think, is relationships. And that's something that anyone can have and anyone can build. And that's, I guess, a big part of what I'm talking to you about. So when I say poke the system, I mean try one thing and see what happens. Just try one thing. And I'm gonna, and there's a thing called the butterfly effect in complexity theory or chaos theory you may have heard of. Very small actions can have huge impact and very unpredictable results. Not always good, but they can have big impact. Now, when you poke the system, of course, you've got to balance for yourself risk and reward, right? There's some risk to poking the system, always. There's some risk to working on your wiggle room, but there, there is reward, too. Chris Ortiz um, worked at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, MasterCard in technology, sometimes agile projects, sometimes quote agile projects that not, are not agile at all. So what did Chris do? He worked at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. The uh, CEO, I think, was a former military man. And everyone in the company wore white shirts and blue pants or skirts. It was a dress code. It, was, it looked like the Marines, he said, when he went to work. So what did he do? The, what did he, what's the one thing that he did that poked the system? He didn't follow the dress code. So he would wear nice clothes, but you know, not blue pants <laughs> and not a white shirt. It wasn't written down anywhere, right? So what happened? It seems like a very small change, doesn't it? Tiny, tiny little thing. What happened? Well, number one, people would start coming up to him asking, how do you get away with that? How do you get away with that? Well, I just do it. <laughs> yeah, but I could never get away with that. <sighs> I could never get away with that. How do you get away with that? I just do it. And what happened? He kept doing it. You think I'm going to say, well, then suddenly there was a dress code revolution. No, no, nobody else changed their dress code. Nobody, just him. But what happened was people started... He also did this thing where he would draw a picture every morning. He would go into his cubicle and had a whiteboard there, and he would draw a picture on the whiteboard, just like a scene, a landscape or whatever, tree, whatever. What happened was people started thinking of him as that creative guy. <laughs> He's that creative guy. He's over... He's in the tech building, but he's a, lot, he's a creative guy. And so what would happen was, when they started getting stuck, they would start to, they started to say, let's, let's go talk to the creative guy. We've got a problem, we can't solve it. Let's talk to the creative guy. And lo and behold, he starts getting pulled in to all of the biggest problems and conflicts, all the double binds and double, single and double loop learning problems and everything else in the company. Suddenly he was the one that was actually running all the change stuff, <laughs> okay? Just by changing his clothes. <laughs> Just by changing his clothes. That's a success story. This guy, Mitch Sipas is his name. He used to work in the humanitarian aid as an official guy. He became a kind of unofficial guy. So he, he didn't like it. I mean, basically what happened was, what happens is in, in humanitarian aid there are a lot of rules that make it very difficult to actually give humanitarian aid. Uh, one example he gave me was he was in a refugee camp in Kenya, one of the biggest ones in the world, and he said, well, you're not allowed to talk to the people in the camp. <laughs> you know, if you're going across the camp, you have to get into air-conditioned white SUV, and you have to be driven by a driver with a bodyguard across the camp. So, of course, Mitch is the trickster, by the way, all consultants are tricksters. I'm a trickster, you know, just, it's, it is in the nature of that role because the trickster is the character that lives on the threshold, neither inside nor outside, right? So a consultant is inside the company, but also outside the company at the same time. That's the, that's the kind of the, the de defining uh, characteristic of a trickster. So he left the humanitarian aid organization. He went out freelance. And he gets an email or a call from the mayor of Mogadishu. 
out of the blue. And the guy said, well, we don't have a lot of budget and we don't have, we just wondering if you can help us. He put up a website, of course. That's probably how he got the email. And he said, I don't know but I, either, but I'm getting on a plane. He went to Mogadishu. Here's an example of uh, sort of him exploring a system and understanding it. So again, he does a lot of visualization, a lot of mapping, a lot of looking, a lot of diagramming and drawing. Um, it's one of his notebooks. Here's the kind of questions he asks. And this is the one place in my PowerPoint where you're going to see a font today. <laughs> yeah, I'm asking them simply, hey, how do you feel about your life? Is it what you want it to be? If not, why not? What do you think is your biggest obstacle? What would you like to do in the future? What do you think you need to do that? You see that? Goals, resources, constraints, right? Trying to get a breakdown of everyone's hopes, dreams, and frustrations. Trying to build a picture of the system, of the bigger game. So, hello. There we go. All right, so he's talking to some fishermen. They're fishing, Somali fishermen. Uh, asking these questions, and they say, well, we're catching more fish than ever before. We're drowning in fish. We got lots of fish, but we're not making any money. Why not? Well, we take the fish to the fish market, and there's no refrigeration, and the fish sit out all day, and at the end of the day, if nobody buys them, we have to discount the fish to the cheapest price, and uh, practically have to give them away. We don't make any money. Of course, everybody knows that, so everybody waits. They don't even show up to the fish market until the end of the day, and so we're in a problem here. Okay, so this is the fish market. I think this is the fish market when it's not open, because I don't see any fish. So he's walking in another part. He's wandering around the system again in another place, and he gets a lemonade. He buys a lem can of lemonade, and he's drinking a lemonade, and there's ice in there. <laughs> and he's like, there's no electricity. How can there be ice here? And he asked the people who he got the lemonade from. And it turns out there's this guy with this equipment, gas-powered equipment and these giant sarcophagi. And he makes these refrigerator-sized blocks of ice, OK? And he goes to the guy. Oh, I thought I had a picture of him with the guy. Um, and he says, how'd you like to expand your business? To the, fish, to the fish market. What do you need? What are your goals? How can I help you? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, well, I, you know, I, I'd, uh, here's what I'd need. Uh, connect the dots, right? This is, this is an example of what I called before positive deviance. Something that's happening in the system that the other parts of the system are not aware of. Something that's good. So connecting a problem to a solution that's already there. You see how this is different than tr flying in with helicopters and trying to drop the solutions onto things, which is how we usually do change management, by the way? Right? Find the solution inside the system. Because it's the system that's trying to, it's a living thing, it's trying to become something. So that's number two, tinker. Here's number three. This is kind of the hardest and most interesting part. How do you help the system become aware of itself? Help the system become aware of itself. What does that mean? It means help all other people besides you start to see the system of work. Deming said 90 some percent of the problems in any workplace are in the system, not in the people. I think a somewhat friend of mine on Facebook just posted recently um, in Dallas, the Ebola thing where the guy was from Liberia and he got sent home from the hospital. Everybody did everything right. Nobody was at fault. Everybody did everything according to the rules of what they were supposed to do. But obviously the system broke down, right? The system failed in that case. That's 90% of the problems that we see in our organizations are the system. Not, they can't be fixed by people just trying harder. The system has to change, which means the game has to change. So how do you help the system become aware of itself? Number one of these is the most important. This is the thing that makes everything else possible. You have to find a way to create safe space. There's a lot of fear in organizations, a lot of fear, a lot of stress, a lot of horses tied to plastic chairs, <laughs> right? You need to create a safe place for, for these conversations to even happen. 
Then you want to learn to see together, you want to learn to play together, and even to dream together about what the new game might look like. And so in a way, it's like a guerrilla movement that I'm talking about. If you're a smart, I believe, if you're a smart CEO, smart VP, you'll, this is what you'll do, instead of trying to hammer change through the organization. So Chris Ortiz, again, the guy I mentioned uh, who, at Enterprise, um, had a great way of creating safe space. He just, in his cubicle, he had electric tea kettle and all kinds of teacups and all kinds of tea. So he kind of created a place in his little cubicle that was attractive for people to come and have, and he would invite people to come and have tea with him. And uh, he, he told me that it was an interesting thing that he was sort of a byproduct that he discovered. Again, this is another example of poking the system. People would come and they said, can you do this? Can you make tea in your cubicle? <laughs> How do you get away with it? Is this illegal? Can you make <laughs> Yeah, he said, oh yeah, I do it all the time. Yeah, have some tea, sit down, have tea. And uh, of course, you know, by this time he's getting some reputation, so people are also coming to him with problems. Sometimes people are coming to him furious, angry. Sometimes angry with him. And he said, I discovered it's impossible to be angry with a hot cup of tea in your hand. <laughs> so people would come, they'd be hopping mad, and he would say, just one, okay, let's just make some tea. And it takes a little time, you gotta wait for the water to boil. You know, you gotta put the tea, you gotta steep the tea for a bit. And it's like, okay, what's the problem? Well, I guess I'm a little calmer now, I can tell you about the problem. Okay, safe place, safe space. Um, you know, having uh, lunch and learns, brown bags is a really, can be a good way to create safe space. Uh, trust is really important. It's uh, like someone said about um, uh, loyalty or uh, someone said something about it has to be earned. C community, the right to have a community has to be learned, something like that. This has to be learned, this has to be earned. Safe space has to be earned, trust has to be earned, and it's not earned in a short period of time, it's over a long period of time. As you can, ima as you can imagine, making tea in your cubicle is a long-term strategy. It's not a quick fix, it's not a short-term fix, right? It's a, a long-term strategy that helped him build a better picture of the organization that he's trying to change. And also, you know, create allies and so forth. Seeing together. I do think diagramming and drawing pictures, especially collaboratively, is very powerful. Drawing those oscillations. Do you see how we go back and forth between this and this? Does it seem to like, well, no, let me draw. If you draw something on a whiteboard, um, oftentimes, even if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter because people will pick up a pen and redraw it for you and help you figure it out. And that's going to be a very powerful collaborative activity. Hold your theories loosely. Try on multiple theories. Draw some diagrams, try and figure out what are, the, what are the feedback loops and the dynamics of what's going on. Every time we do this, we get this pushback. Why? That kind of thing. Play together. You prototype possibilities, you can test boundaries. There's a guy named Chris Argerus who has this idea that you, you don't have to believe that something's gonna work. You can do an experiment. You can act as if it were true. Act as if it were true. Let's act as if we are not in a cutthroat, competitive industry, dog eat dog. Let's act if cooperation was the way that it worked and see what happens. Let's just try it for a month. So acting as if can be a very powerful tool. We don't have to believe it. We can just act as if it were true and see if something changes. This is part of that double loop learning thing. Okay, dream together. Here's the thing, remember this. The system that you're in was created by people. It's an invention. In some ways, it's a fiction. That you're, it's a collective fiction. If it can be created by people, it can be changed by people. 10 seconds, minutes, minutes? Yeah, no, fine, we're good. <laughs> oh, 10, Ooh, I got a 10. <laughs> no, it's fine, we're on the home stretch. And we're gonna be drinking soon, and we can talk more. This guy, Jason Roberts, anyone ever see, he gave a TED talk. Excellent TED talk, highly recommended. This guy had been visiting Europe, came back from Europe, and he, uh, he's like, he lives in Dallas. Why don't we have these big plazas with pigeons and street vendors and all this great stuff? Why are we just, ha why, why in our city don't we have that? We have these giant freeways and these long, empty spaces. I want more of what I had in Europe. 
and I want more of that feeling. So here's what he did. He, so first of all, the, in the city council, they had all these rules. And the rules were, you know, it costs $1,000 to have an outdoor table. If you want to have cafe seating, you have to get a license for that, blah, blah, blah. So he just said, you know what? I'm gonna, we're going to get a group of my buddies together. We're going to break every rule that we possibly can. And we're going to invite the city council down. And we're going to show them what could happen. And we're going to ask them about all, why we have all these rules. So they literally, you know, they blocked, they, they basically did a lot of stuff that is technically illegal, right? But they had the support of the neighborhood. Cafe seating, look at this guy, he's painting a crosswalk. <laughs> this is on a weekend, right? We're going to transform this neighborhood, right? Put, they painted, uh, put in bike paths, they put in cafe seating. They completely did a pop-up urban planning scenario, all right? Okay, whoops, sorry. So what, what do you think happened? What, what do you think this happened with the city council? So this is, again, identifying a conflict, right? This is a conflict, conflict between the rules and what you want. Highlighted the conflict, the city council people came, and they're like, we don't know why we have these rules. They're hundreds of years old. We, we don't need, we can get rid of those rules. We don't need them. This is great. This is awesome. Let's do this. <laughs> again, it's like the horse tied to the plastic chair. Right? The constraints were imaginary. They were just old rules that nobody even knew why they were there. Woody Zool, anybody know Woody Zool? Heard of mob programming? There's another interesting thing about collective group working. Basically, uh, he works on a software team as like a sprinkler company, like a company that does sprinkler systems and stuff. And he does the software that runs it. And it's very complex software. And I had a team. And when he got there, I think everyone was working individually and they were spending a lot of time coordinating all this complex software and they were having meetings about meetings and things were breaking all the time. So he started doing pair programming. You know what pair programming is? Basically one person programming, the other person watching. And so two people are always aligned about what's being built. Well, his philosophy, which I love, is turn up the good. If something's working, turn it up. Pair programming works, let's try three people. Let's try four people. And here's where he ended up. I wonder if I can, if I click this, will it show the video? No. How do I do it? Can you uh, click on that or something? There's a video there. I don't think I can do it from here. There we go. That's it. Just click it. I think this will work. OK. So you can get this on YouTube. But this is a day in the life. His whole team, they found one person coding, everyone else in the room talking, working together, they're more productive than everybody working separately. This is a day in life, this is pretty fast. First hour, learning, they have projectors, they're projecting the screen on the wall. One computer, one computer. How many people, like five? There's the driver, they call him the driver. He's driving the bus. Put some code in. They switch, every 15 minutes they switch the driver. So everybody's driving for 15 minutes. That's the product owner, customer. <laughs> That's Woody on the right there. Very humble, as you can see, not doing any work. <laughs> see, isn't that powerful? Turn up, and that's just simply turn up the good. We got something that's working, turn it up. Turn it up, keep turning it up. Okay, so three things, study the system, tinker, help the system become aware of itself. Now, I don't want to ignore the risk. I think the risk is an important piece. And that's why I think being detached from your personal objectives has to be a huge part of any kind of change like this. You can't always have to get it your way. You have to be looking for the good of the whole. You have to be trying to be a catalyst for making the thing happen that you want to see happen. And it's not, it's not necessarily the thing that you want to see happen, it's the thing that the organization needs to move to its next level of development. It's like a seed, an acorn is not going to turn into a palm tree. The seed of what the organization can become is there. You can't really change that. You can help it grow. You can help it get there. So that fuzzy goal is important. Hold your goals loosely. Here's the thing. 
No matter what, you're building your own capabilities no matter what. No matter what. And if you go through the whole trickster mythology and you look at real life too, there are three, if you hold your goals loosely, there are three ways that this trickster's journey can end. Three ways. One is you stay, <laughs> right? You stay within the company. Either the change happens on a small way, a large way, in whatever way you decide you're gonna stay. You're gonna live there. You're part of that community. You're gonna help it grow. Two is you go. That's the Uber story, right? Or the Airbnb story. You, re you take all the stuff that you figured out and you go start up another company doing it the way that it ought to be done, right? That's the startup story. So number one is the big company story or the larger company, stay. Work the system from within. Number two is you go. Number three is you stay on the threshold. That means you somehow, like me, have become so addicted to the change and seeing those things happen that you just want to do it over and over. You become a teacher or a consultant or someone who likes to live on the threshold, not totally inside, not totally outside, on the threshold. But I think the thing to remember is, no matter what, you're building capabilities. You're building your future. You're building a future that you want. Thanks.